you know, there's a lot of us. Um, it's usually historically been me doing the presentations. I'm frankly bored with it, and I feel that people may be bored too. So we have that much in common. So there's some new faces over here. Um, I live in a small village in Western Spain. I have a website. You can read about my work if you want. But I'm going to pass it off to my wonderful co-hosts. Um, starting, if you've seen the new tweet, we have our fan picture where I'm on the left, and then Sofia is on the center. So over to you, Sofia. Thanks, Dako. Hi, everybody. I'm also in a, in a sort of muggy Monday evening, murky, muggy sort of twilight zone feels like. Really so happy to be here. I'm new to Disco as an organisation, but I'm sort of in the um, absolutely on board the spirit of it all. And um, I'm a long time facilitator. I work with basically the notion of living systems and uh, how we can collaborate better. So Disco speaks to all of my core values. And yeah, fantastic to do this with you today. I'm going to pass you on to Felipe. Over to you, Felipe. Hi, guys. Um, I'm as well a long time facilitator, um, having acted most of my career in Brazil and in uh, marginal territories with a lot of field work um, since the Occupy movement and etc. And I've joined Disco as well recently, and I've been living in Europe for the last four years and adjusting and learning. And we've combined our experiences and powers to, to create this workshop for you today. Amazing. Uh, thank you all. I just wanted to say something. Sorry, I, I, I did um, forget to uh, mention uh, just at the beginning there that the hope is that this will go on a little longer today um, to fit in with the session. So uh, understandable if people have other appointments, but um, the guys are hoping that it could be a three hour session today um, to fit in all of the content and also all of the breakout and discussion stuff as well. Um, so if you need to leave earlier than that because you have other appointments, please, you know, please do. Um, but um, if it does run over, know that we're doing that on, on purpose. It's not a sort of accidental timing issue. Um, sorry, I just wanted to pop that in. Um, back over to you guys. I think it's Sophia to start. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce myself in the format that I'm inviting us all to do, to jump in and share um, your name and where you're from. And uh, a, li a little wild card question. Um, what are your feelings on snakes? What are the pros and cons? So I'm Sophia and I'm in London, South London. And snakes, uh, pros, they remind me of the dark side. Cons, uh, slippery and I'm going to take this uh, imaginary ball and pass it on to the person that I can see next in the video. There you go, Christina. You need to unmute yourself, Christina. Hello, is that all right? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Christina Yenka and um, <clears throat> What am I? Nothing much, but um, I'm really interested in um, uh, getting out of the state market system, which I think is destroying our lives and our planet. So I was absolutely enthralled to read the Fair, Free and Alive um, book. Uh, and um, also, I've recently read another book called Sand Talk by... Tyson Yukaporta. He's an Australian amazing man. And his book is very much on the same lines. And it's it's a kind of very deep way of, of communication as well, which is fantastic. So I'm really looking forward to this. Now, going back to um, Sophia on snake. Um, snake to me, they're very beautiful creatures. And um, they represent for me a lot of knowledge um, and um, wisdom. So yes, I like snakes. <laughs> That's me done. Thank you, thank you. Um, like next on the screen, Amy. Love to hear what, your name, where you're from, where you're going, and pros and cons of snakes. Sorry, was that me? I didn't quite hear. Yes, and if anyone can't hear me wave and I will speak up, just to say. Um, love to know 
what your name is, well, it says on the screen if it's different, what, what, what direction you're roughly going in and what are the pros and cons of snakes to you? Um, so I'm Amy Niverku, and um, as you can probably guess, I'm from Ireland, uh, Dublin, and I have been a pet sitter for the past three years to fund going to college, um, and now I'm hoping to set up a cooperative pet care um, to give to give pet sitters a lot more um, quality of life and unfair working um, conditions. Um, in terms of snakes, Ireland obviously has a, a large um, mythological connection with them. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of fun with them in, in March um, in Cannes. Um, my family emigrated to Australia a few years ago, so they're terrorised by them over there. So <laughs> mixed feelings. Thank you. Love the mythological element. Um, Mike, Hales. Hi there, everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Hales. I'm here on the south coast of England in Brighton. Um, I seem to be involved in building a, a college, uh, an invisible college of, um, sort of activist capability in making a living economy uh, and commoning. Yep. So, uh, and I've been tracking disco uh, for quite some time now. It's really good to be here. Uh, I think the pieces of the college are going to be discos. So, um, yeah, it's really quite central. As far as snakes are concerned, um, in England, I don't have much of a relationship with snakes. Um, we have one poisonous snake in England, and which is the adder. And I do know a place where in the summer on a hot sunny day, I can go and probably see adders uh, mating, which is just magical and, and wonderful. Um, completely beautiful, but very out of the ordinary. Um, funnily enough, just yesterday, I was remembering the part that snakes played in the matriarchal religions, you know, way back around the time of Alexander the Great, when the, the male religions were, were taking over. So, yeah, uh, snakes just happen to be my thoughts at the moment. OK, that's me. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, next on the screen, Dave, David Rich. Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, um, I, I'm uh, from England, but I'm living with my wife in Austria at the moment, and uh, we move back to England in the middle of next year. Uh, in the countryside, maybe there'll be snakes. If there is, I'm uh, both fascinated and uh, wary of snakes. I think it's a pretty instinctive thing to, to jump if you see one. I went for a swim in my local... Uh, hotel uh, uh, a few weeks ago and there was a snake in the changing room which really surprised me just a harmless grass snake but uh, I had quite a fight um, yeah I'm, I'm uh, interested in getting in the, um, uh, involved in uh, social uh, change and uh, community building and, and stuff like that so that's why this uh, this workshop intrigues me nice to be here Thank you. Thank you very much. Warren Bramley. Hello. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Warren. I'm based in Sheffield, uh, north of England, just on the edge of the Peak District. Um, and I'm, I'm a designer and I'm taking a bit of time off and getting into involved in stuff which I know nothing about, hence why I'm here today. So I keep signing up for stuff I know nothing about. Um, Stay to action, do some amazing stuff. So I keep signing up to their stuff. So that's me. And then snakes. I've got a four-year-old daughter and a gran sent her loads of posters she'd been collecting. And and she could choose which post she wanted to put on a wall. And all these nice posters of birds and animals and polar bears and all this. And she put one up with snakes. She thought it was quite a bold move at four. So that's what came to my mind when he said snakes. So yeah, nice to meet everyone. Thank you, Warren, and thank you for input from different generations, particular daughter. Uh, Gary, Gary. Hello, everybody. I'm Gary. Um, 
I live in, uh, in, in Norfolk in England, but I grew up in New York City. A uh, long time interest in collaborative, sustainable communities, commons, viable systems. I'm working with Sophia on the Planet Makers project. I think I've been running into Mike Hales in the meet.coop stuff. Yes, so we haven't actually met before. Stacko, I've run into over the years at a range of conferences. We've met a number of times. I hope that's all other people look vaguely familiar. Um, looking forward to this meeting. Thank oh, snakes. 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 Uh, I don't know much about snakes. I think it's, I, but I like interesting creatures, like it's a reptile, but it hasn't got legs. So that makes it very unusual. So <laughs> I like snakes. Mm, thank you. Um, Rosie, and do tell me if I pronounce the name wrong. It's Roisin. So you swing out of the end of it, Roisin. Um, hi, everybody. Really nice to meet you. Um, where am I from? Well, I have had a very twisted, snaky like, like movement like journey. So I've worked as um, a community based artist, um, an artist with a social research practice. And I've worked as a management consultant and innovation specialist. So I pretty much use my arts in business and my business in the community and slide the information backwards and forwards where it's needed to disrupt for positive good, let's say. And so I've had this idea about how I can um, really create new business models that have value to the commons in communities. And I have this mad idea that we can uh, abolish poverty by working with ideas and being able to show their of the in communities and I'm I love uh, the idea of disco and I'm I'm kind of feeling into it that it might be the people I've been looking for uh, no pressure guys um <laughs> and uh that's so that's kind of roughly where I'm going I'm currently at the moment um catalyzing donut economics as a network uh in Ireland as a way to hold different conversations and can see kind of relationships between what I think I might be able to do after this workshop and take that off both to public sector businesses and in community conversations. Um, at the moment, I'm trying to understand how to really host conversations with people on different polarities. So climate deniers, climate non-engagers and climate activists and everything in between all of those spaces and communities um, politics, everything. Um, I'm based in the southeast of Ireland. Hey, Amy. Um, about 80 kilometers, probably south of wherever Amy's sitting. Um, and yeah, and I think that we have great advantage with digital Zoom and, and COVID, and we've got to make the most of that. So thank you guys for this session. Um, snakes. Uh, there's two things, the slither and slide, I think is great movement, uh, relating back to the disco, love that. And then the, the con I see is the um, articulation of the negative of like snake oil and uh, snaky dealings and snaky politicians. So that's the piece. Awesome, thank you, Roisin, thank you. I'm gonna pass straight on to Nick, Nick Stoke. Hello, um, um, my, my name is Nick Stoko. Yeah, I live in Edinburgh, and um, I'm a software engineer. Um, I, 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 I so it, I've been following the P2P Foundation for a, quite a long time. I'm quite intrigued by the idea that there might be a commons transition on the way, and that co the commons economy might outcompete capitalism. And um, I have tried to be shifting in that direction. Um, I'm now a member of a co-op freelan of freelancers and I'm doing some work for the Solidarity Economy Association based in London, uh, uh, Oxford, sorry. Um, and um, hello, Mike. I know Mike from Social Co-op. We used to work together on there. Uh, and snakes. Um, I'm respectful of snakes. I don't dislike them, but I don't 
I don't really have any snakes to um, to to to, uh, to hand or anything like that. So that's enough for me. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, anyone new here? I think Maroso. It's just who you are, what, roughly which direction you're going, and pros and cons of snakes. Wild card question. I'm going to now hand over to Simon. Okay. Hi there, um, my name is Simon Redding. I um, live about seven, eight miles from Warren, actually. So hi, Warren. <laughs> um, in uh, North Derbyshire Coalfields. Um, and I've been working as a social entrepreneur and recently as a, um, a person who's helped social entrepreneurs um, within uh, Chesterfield, my town. Um, and uh, we're looking at setting up a new hub um, for young people to set up cooperatives. And I thought, ooh, yes, this sounds very interesting. Um, for So I thought I'd you know, come along and see what was involved in disco, because everyone's up for disco. Um, <laughs> and uh, so snakes, um, well, around me, snakes come uh, in two places, really. Um, you know, one is the beautiful Peak District National Park, you know, sort of go out, you know, get yourself lost in the hills. The other one is all the sort of like post-industrial kind of um, spaces that have fallen to rack and ruin. And then you can sort of like, uh, you know, go and find snakes in the middle of the old ruins. Um, so I guess that's a, you know, one way of looking at the whole thing, really. Um, but in both situations, you, they're adders, as somebody else mentioned. So you've got to be careful about where you stand. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. Um, Katie. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm not working in this sector, but it's an area which really interests me. Um, I'm engaged with the Schumacher Institute in Bristol, and part of that is very much around systems approaches. And so actually, when you mentioned snakes, I was remembering a story that I heard recently, which has a sort of systems angle to it, um, which is about a village where there's a problem with snakes kind of um, in the village. And so the village leader tried to decide to put a, a price on a snake head. And so everybody... You know, it brings the snakes to him, but the unintended consequence is that people then set up snake farms. And so um, then it suddenly end up with rather more snakes than um, they bargained for. So um, <laughs> very much about thinking through the kind of potential unintended consequences of what you're doing. Um, so, um, yeah, very much here to learn. And, um, yeah, great to be with people from um, all over all over the world. It's brilliant. So. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so lovely the interconnection. Um, Maro. Don't know if you can hear me, Maro. I think the screen might be frozen. So just I'm going to. Uh, oh, we got you. Okay. Yeah. Let's try because I am having this internet issues with my Zoom. Uh, just if you can hear me well, this is Maro and I am a human rights lawyer. I have worked with immigrants and asylum seekers. I am working on IT and technology, new technologies. I know a little bit of blockchain and I am a SQA tester. Uh, so, and I am part of this disco, disco notes that uh, we are doing this great project. Snakes. Um, I like it, but even only when they don't are very close to me. I am the bodyguard of my partner because he's terrifying with his neck, so I have to, <laughs> to rescue him when because we have some snakes here at home. So. I think so, uh, Oh, okay. We have to, to live with them, but doing anything, I can run out, but I am. Okay, I, the internet's breaking up, but thank you, Maro. I, I got the gist. Um, Thomas, if you're there, Thomas, I, I think you're there. Hello. Yeah, you're there. The can you hear me? To go. Yes, please. 
Yeah, good. Yeah, I've had some internet problems. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Tom and I'm on the south edge of Dartmoor National Park in Devon, in England. Um, and I'm interested in alternative types of organisation. And I'm interested in commons and peer to peer. And I'm thinking about those things at the moment in relation to care work which is where I've spent the majority of my working time, 15, 16 years. Um, and uh, yeah, so really interested to learn more about distributed co-ops. Um, and snakes, well, <clears throat> I don't really have uh, too many thoughts or feelings about snakes. Only that when you mentioned it, I had a dream a few months ago about a snake where I was sort of grappling with the snake and trying to Put the snake into a bag which i successfully achieved so i'm not too sure about what that meant dream meanings and all that but that was the only thought about snakes i had when you mentioned them so yeah nice to nice to meet everyone and looking forward to the uh, webinar thank you thomas and yes yeah, so the snakes bring up lots of different things for people it's an interesting one so nice to hear where everyone is at um we're going to get to know each other more so we're going to pass on now to the next um segment where Felipe will ask a, a different kind of question to everybody um so Felipe if you all good to go I can hand the wonderful group over and you're muted at the moment so just so you know yeah no it's, it's just too many too many screens and things so I see I see that we have a lot in common in this room actually more more feels that there's more alignment of direction um, than tension. And the question that I want to pose you guys is a question that we think about a lot and all day. What is, so what do you feel that uh, an anti-capitalist future of work could look like? Um, and I want you guys to have a, a silent reflection about this. And there's two, two follow-up questions, right? How does this vision of a future of work make you feel from literally from the feeling direction, right? And what types of work exist beyond capitalism? And if you have a notebook on the side or you have a little open document or you have some post-its, um, I do encourage you to, to register and to harvest what's coming up. Even if it feels weird or silly or obvious, don't self-judge, just let it rain down or down, you know? Snakes don't second guess themselves too much. So what does a anti-capitalist future of work look like? How does it make you feel? What types of work are there? Well, I can have a go if you like. <laughs> um, I don't know very much about any of it, but you've asked me um, um, how, how I would feel. I would I I mean, in because um, I, I must confess, Christine is my mum and, and mum, so um, we're just having a little moment of silence. Oh, right. But I'm glad that this little mishap has uncovered your secret. <laughs> you snakes. But let's let's take a two minute moment to just be alone with this question. Sorry, I, I should have highlighted it um, more explicitly. Not your fault, Christine.
Okay, so I invite you to slowly come back. And let's, why not start with Christina? Um, I'm sorry, I, I am probably a bad person to start because I don't really know much about it all. But when you asked me, how would it feel? What would it feel like to be in an anti-capitalist work era thing? Um, that would be a joy um, where the work was to benefit the community and um, where the profits, if you like, went back into the community. Um, and that and people and there's there's no that everybody is the same with the, the, the same value the same um worth whatever they're doing um and uh how does that vision make me feel absolutely elated so i'll just leave it at that <laughs> okay thank you um but so just quickly underscoring to feel elated that uh, everybody's the same and the profits go back into community. I'm gonna invite um, Katie to go on from, from just so we can try to quickly capture. Uh, we, we don't need to repeat what was already said. We can do plus one. And then um, what we have to add on so we can create a collective vision on, on this. Do you feel like you can go Katie? Uh, yes, okay, I could add a cup in a chuck in a couple of things. Um, yeah, so I was thinking how wonderful it would be to be able to focus on the positives rather than mopping up the sort of negative externalities of our current system and dealing with the environmental and social problems. So instead, to have a system which actually is actively improving our environment and actively kind of um, making sure that everyone in society is catered for and we're not increasing inequalities. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I was focused on, but, um, um, yeah, I didn't get much further really in terms of feelings. Oh, um, I suppose I was a bit kind of, um, it feels so far away somehow. So perhaps I was a bit kind of, hmm, <laughs> it feels a bit intangible. So a bit, I was a bit depressed and thinking about the vision because it feels too far away but yes it's a wonderful <laughs> yes it's a great vision on to someone else um <clears throat> Roisin oh sorry um yeah I see I, I would like you guys to to um raise your hands if you have something like strong to say but I'm gonna feel like I want to invite some some. I'm gonna follow a certain intuition that I have to invite some voices, and then I will go to the the raised hands if that works. I also don't expect everybody to know how to use the raised hands, so I'm sort of like doing the the mediation. I was curious to because I felt something that Roshin had a mm. elation moment, and I wanted to hear her out. So, um, great question. Um, so the first one, future of work, what would that look like? So just unfair. And I think COVID's really shunned the spotlight on, on just unfair. Um, UBI possibility, which is uh, universal basic income. Um, I think some open and closed value systems, I think would really work. Um, I saw a tweet the other day about a GP having issues with childcare, and I kind of thought there's an opportunity for, for a systems loop that we have childcare and we have uh, doctors working and that we have this like community care uh, closed or open system to provide what we need in our communities so people can work and especially people with families can work and work in diverse ways that they need to, either if they homeschool or otherwise. Um, and then how does it make me feel? I actually feel hopeful and curious about it. So. Okay, so I, I feel grateful that you offered a, a counterbalance in feeling then the, the, the depression mm. um, of the distance, but also feeling energized by the vision. Um, then Gary, he raised his hand first, is there? 
So if you guys see it somewhere in the software, I'm not exactly sure where, there's a button where you can have a little hand showing up here. Well, if, um, you, if you look at the, the participants panel, uh, if you click okay, on so yeah. participants, it's at the bottom of the participants panel. You can raise your exactly. hand lower or things like that. Okay, anyway, okay. Thanks, this, thanks this for is, sharing. Give us your input. This is a uh, is, is, is long time interest of, of mine. Um, but I would imagine is that people, most people would have a lot of small part-time jobs doing a, a, a wide range of thing, different things at different times, which they can choose from. So it, they will be spending their time doing things that they like doing, and they're not going to be dependent on any one job. Um, if they lose it, there, there's always more coming and going. So it's very flexible, feeling very, very relaxed and supportable, supported. You're working for the community in small enterprises, community enterprises, um, where you, what, what you're trying to do is um, look after people and, and, and planet not going for, for money. Um, that's probably all for, for now. Cool, perfect. Um, Mike was the second one to raise his hand. Thanks, Felipe. Um, yeah, what does it look like? I mean, the, 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 my answer is very quick to come on. It, it looks like commons of commons uh, in all spheres, in all sectors, um, which just feels like a marvellous idea to me. Um, living within Cape Raywood's a donut. Uh, I see this as a practice of dual power in a sort of associationist socialist tradition. Um, so how do I feel about that? I feel inspired. Um, after 50 years of, of, of activism, this movement for the commons just seems, uh, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely what I've been working for all my life. Uh, it's, it's terrific. I think it's the most important movement I've seen in my lifetime. But it, I think it's extremely challenging. Uh, it will need huge amounts of care work. And I actually think the chances of it happening are very small. Uh, because it will need to be produced. It isn't just going to happen. It isn't just going to be spontaneous because I'm a melancholic person and I just don't, I'm not willing to believe that everybody's going to do all the right things suddenly. So so you know, there's a very difficult balance of feeling there. Um, in terms of what kinds of work, you know, there are all sorts of lovely post-money mutualist things that can happen, circular economies, direct exchange. So again, that, that's fantastic. But for a long time yet, people are going to need wages. So I don't know what wage work is going to look like, social wage maybe. Um, yeah, that builds a very complicated kind of question. Okay. But it's, it's, it's cool because it's one of the things we're going to look into today. So we have about more like nine minutes into this movement. So I'm going to ask anyone who has feelings to, to speak to raise the hand with the style that Gary showed us by going to the participants uh, panel and just clicking the hand next to your name. And if you've already spoken, but you have something to say, it could be cool as well, especially if you feel like you're not usually extroverted and now we are feeling extroverted because of the discussion, even better. Uh, Simon, let's, let's hear what you have to say. Hi there. Um, so um, I was looking at the sort of like, uh, thinking about the sort of kind of society um, and where we're at at the moment with economies. Um, key thing for me is that um, the future of work is about building, not repairing things. And that includes people, you know, building people up, not sort of just fixing um, consequences. And that um, it's relational, not transactional. So, um, well, at the moment, I think our economic system has got, well, it's fragmented. It's, it's got to the point where it's not really an economic system between people. It's a series of transactions that are disconnected from each other um, and that we don't have um, relationships between the people who exchange value. So I see something that's uh, deeper um, and perhaps involves things like care and friendship and time, different types of value. So if there's a little bit of a gap between me responding, it's because I'm actually taking notes of everything you guys were saying. Um, but it's also nice to have silence in the conversation. So hold it, you know. Um, Roshin, is, is your hand a plus one or is your hand I have something to say? Okay, cool. 
Um, Warren, you said you know nothing and you've been signing up for things you know nothing about. Uh, I would like to take this moment to just say that it's fine to just be what you are. And, and I would like to hear what's going on through your head in this beginning of adventure that we're having. Okay, so I know nothing, um, which I'm, I'm glad to admit. Um, it was funny, actually, it's how you frame the question. So I got stuck there. So I was listening to Kate Rayworth speak the other day at the RSA. I think Roisin mentioned Kate Rayworth. And she did, somebody tried to pin her on are your ideas kind of relevant to, <clears throat> to capitalism, basically? And she basically just threw it back. And she just said, I don't accept the framing. She said, it depends what you think by capitalism. One person would think one thing, somebody else thinks something else, somebody else thinks something else. She said, if you want to ask me a question about, do I think companies should be set up for stakeholder value and stakeholder value only? Then yeah, I think that's wrong, but don't pull me into the other conversation. And what she was doing was kind of going, and I think it's brilliant. And I've been on quite a lot of this stuff. You're going to hear my, you've, <laughs> you set me off. But I kind of think sometimes that when I see things like this, I feel like we frame it wrong. And it's as if we go, I was on a co-op course, a platform co-op course the other week, know nothing about co-ops. And I had to do four weeks of discussion about overthrowing capitalism before I even got to the idea of starting a bloody co-op. And I thought it was such a difficult, it's like, let's just start with like starting something. And the things that I see on a regular basis, the people starting stuff and doing amazing stuff in my community, mutual aid groups, cooperatives, businesses, social enterprises, the whole thing. But if I didn't stop them and go, are you overthrowing capitalism? They go, no, I'm just doing something really great in my community. And I sometimes think that we just get stuck. So my answer to your question was, I got stuck at the framing, basically. I'm not shouting, by the way, I'm just, I'm, I'm energized by my conversation, which is, I just thought, why did you ask me that? Just ask me the future of work. And if you say the future of work, I go, well, I want to put well-being in the middle of it. Why don't we value companies that, that, that have a well-being in the center of the people that they're working with, that value the environment that, they, that, that they're within, that they are not extractive, they're regenerative. And if that's anti-capitalism, fine, but actually they're just better businesses and better organizations. So I got a bit stuck at the question. Sure. And one of the answers is, We've, we've whacked Marx. We're already into Marx and we're into Marx in the chat box. We've already been here for 15 minutes. Anyway, Lara wants to talk. So that's what I was yeah, thinking. Lara, Lara I'm going to she's raise her head first. But I think, I think I, a lot of people uh, shared your sentiment and that's the perfect direction for us to go with our next five minutes. Christina. Muted, but yes. you'll figure it out. Yeah. I was going to say about um, somebody said they felt depressed about the future and that it was really difficult, that it would be impossible. And I think what um, Warren was saying, it's, it's not a question of overthrowing the system. It's that the system is becoming, it, it's like Mark said, it's, it's, um, it's falling in its own mess that it's made. And what we have to do is build up something locally, build up um, things that, you know, they say it's no good getting rid of a, a, a system. The, you make something that makes it obsolete. That's what we have to do. We have to make a system that makes capitalism obsolete. And it's failing at the moment. And people, most people, I think, somewhere down in them want another system so people are ready to accept it I think I just wanted to say that and I and I think there's so much we can do for that okay. let's let's segue into Laura thank you I hope you don't mind me um chipping in as well not at all you're uh, just as human as everyone else Thank you. Um, Warren, uh, very much refreshing to hear what you said. Um, and obviously I work for an organization, Stir to Action, and, and we're hosting this webinar. So I'm going, I'm not going to be careful actually. Um, but you know, we're, we're doing stuff that's all about the new economy, democratic economy, all of that sort of stuff all of the time. But however, I do, I do definitely resonate with some of what, what Warren was articulating. And in my own sort of reflection, what I noticed, which was surprising to me actually, is that some of my feelings were around chaos and feeling scared and um, concerned about conflict. And that was surprising to me because I'm, I work and live in a sort of very symbiotic 
relation where lots of people think the same as I do when we're all working towards this, you know, anti-capitalist or different system or whatever it is. So that was quite interesting to tap into my feelings that are actually quite fearful and worried about conflict. Um, and also, I think the point that hasn't been made yet is maybe about the transitioning of whatever it is into whatever, you know, from, from capitalism into whatever is next is a, and I think Mike said this, is a, is a long and complicated one. And, and yes, it's, it's important to visualize the future, vision the future, but the transition is an interesting one uh, that maybe I feel like isn't talked about enough. Um, and actually, if it's one or the other, you're always leaving behind, mm. you know, capitalism is what the system that has existed. So to, to talk about a different system that none of us know what it looks like yet, um, I think we, you know, I think we really need to dig deep and try and bring along what it is, the, the, the learnings that we've, we've um, come across. And one of the last things I wanted to just say is that I read a book last year that's been really useful for me called Collaborative Intelligence. And they talk about CQ. So I, rather than IQ, CQ. So the intelligence of us all together. And that was really useful in all of um, all of this thinking about, so how do we bring, many people are quite fixed to capitalism, those who it works for. So how do we think with those who think differently? So this is kind of the, the, the end of the a lot of time for this discussion. So I just want to uh, highlight a couple of things as we as we move. Not a close because nothing is closed. We're still at the process of opening boxes and realizing the thing that lies between us. But um, so first thing I want to notice is that Amy, Nick, David uh, didn't have as much, and Maro didn't have as much voice time. So let's all as a group, and Thomas, let's as a group, just remember this softly. And the other thing is, um, I felt so much that we're talking about the process of being and becoming, right? Even capitalism only had a name after it happened. And I think the, the call that Warren said is like, instead of figuring out what is the system and how, how is it called and, and how does it look conceptually, why don't we just make things that work? And that is sort of what lies at the, I, if you feel I misrepresented what you said, Warren, but you can then slam, slam me later. But figuring out things that, that work is sort of what's at the center of, of what we're gonna do for the next couple of hours, right? Um, oh, my timer went off. It's supposed to be invisible, but I, it happened. Uh, so we invite Sophia to take over again, and she's gonna give us an introduction to the pr principles that we are playing with at the disco, which you're free to, to take in and, and mold. And we're gonna be doing this for the next couple of hours. Um, is everybody okay? Do, do, do we have to do any cleanup after this discussion or can we just move? Cool. Thank you, Felipe. And um, this is a distributed new way of working for so many of us. When I say this, I'm speaking to, in a way, what disco is, is one generous, wonderful, grounded example of how we can start to step into the new possibilities and I think that as we start to and as we practice these kinds of things we'll we'll get our di different senses of how the best of different things can be combined and um, we'll be able to see further once we've actually jumped in so I am going to take you through some of the disco principles I'm new to this, although you know this is for, I'm part of the networks. I'm new to the detail of it. Stacco has generously invited me to step you through. I find that very generous, and this for me is part of the trust that we've built in the ways that we work together. So there's going to be sort of an open collaboration here as we do it. And one thing, I, um, uh, Felipe and Stacco, I must. Um, if I could have the slides up unless you want me to share my version. And I want to share with everyone that people are coming from very different places here in terms of experience, practice, what people have read. So there is nothing to, right, I'll speak for myself. I'm not ashamed that I don't know all of it. I don't know all of it. And so that, so I welcome, for example, Stacco or Felipe, if you want to jump in, if I miss anything, please do so. So we're going to start sharing the screen in a moment. And, um, and, and please don't, Fear. I, this is, I've seen these principles before, obviously, we're working with them, but it takes time, I think, to cognitively take them in 
and then how we think about putting them into practice, which you'll be doing today on this workshop, and, and then actually to experience them and see the, the scale effects of them or the scope effects of them, because um, we don't want to always be thinking about scale. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a chance to grab what you can and please don't feel like you've got to sort of memorize everything on the screen, because I think that takes us away from just I think if we get one of the principles, if you can get one of the principles and really have a go in your groups at, at thinking about one of them, that's more solid than trying to get everything in one. And of course, some of you might really be very fast with all of this and be able to grab everything pretty much straight away. But I would say do be patient with those who are experiencing some of these things for the first time, because we need so much different wisdom on board. Um, all righty, let's just take a breather. You, I mean, feel free to have your notepads ready, etc. And now we have um, Stucco screen sharing, which is wonderful. So yeah, just, I, just to make mm -hmm. sure, because I can't see you, can everyone see the screen? We can people, see the screen. People okay. are muted, so if anyone can't. Yes, can see it. Okay, so I'm DJing and Sophia is the MC, so we'll try and put it together for you. Go. You're muted now, Sophia. So, lip well done, Sophia. Slides. Okay. Um, this slide evokes this sort of networked blockchain DAO enabled world. Don't worry if these terms aren't familiar. Um, they, it's the distributed networks and Internet of Things in the future that will resolve our systems and help us work together and have trust automated. Um, and you'll, you know, hear a lot of promises from the world of tech that, that, says what we'll be able to do and um and it can be quite scary um if you i stopped watching black mirror there's a netflix series called black mirror with lots of dystopian future um, um views of what happens when we in you know the the, the 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 we have this new uh, blockchain enabled world etc and post blockchain etc um and for those who don't know blockchain is just this distributed ledger system so you have um, this, there's the possibility to have uh, encrypted, um, a, a, a open, um, anonymous transactions, and that can lead to things like smart contracts where um, a lot of our normal societal operations that we would normally do through human collaboration gets done automatically, and the DAO is a distributed autonomous organization. And for some people, this is a dream come true. Wow, we don't have to trust humans, the, the, the machines can just do it. And for others, it's terrifying. So we need something different. And the proposition is cooperative and something instead of um, just with the old economic principles, we have also the feminist principles where we value things like care and reproductive work, um, commons oriented, and uh, also with open value systems. Oh, sorry, open value accounting, so that transparency. So this is a very exciting propositions and so to call them de distributed cooperative organizations. We thought, let's come up with something different. And we came up with da 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 da, disco, wonderful word. Some um, people already vibing to it earlier. I love this slide. Um, so the disco is this notion of the, what, um, and we're gonna step through this, Principles Sucker will do that in a little while. And this is um, a practical way to start actually making this happen with each other. Um, so, yeah, so four things at the core of discos and that they are, um, so those of you not familiar with any of the language here, don't worry, essentially um, it's, so we can, it's a P2P, not Napster, but um, peer-to-peer principles at the heart of it. Um, there's the openness and all the aspects of how we have um, open and trust-based networks. And then it's, uh, the openness is also that we have, um, uh, that people can define their own value flows and that is openly uh, viewable. And, and, and we can value, th therefore, contributions that might not be valued in the capitalist system, like 
care, as we mentioned, a lot of the stuff that happens invisibly, which creates trust. And, and as we know, it's so much more efficient when we have trust. And then, and this speaks to the feminist economics, um, which is about valuing those, uh, um, the hidden work, the, 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 the labor, the, the, the admin, for example, that goes into making things happen and that can be um, underestimated in its value. So um, these are the four principles at the core of DISCO and um, they go into all the principles. Uh, let's see. So, so there was this lovely notion of platform co-ops and instead of, for example, Airbnb that was um, owned by only a few people still, even though it was enabling sharing, um, we have these um, platform co-ops that are able to be owned by more people. Um, but still, we didn't have the, um, uh, the feminist economics of care and the valuing reproductive work in there and also the open value accounting. So we've gone from the traditionals to this kind of like, okay, it's a whole platform like Airbnb, but we can all own it. Um, and this openness to where we have the, also the feminist economics running through it all. Um, yeah, and, and of course this is uh, the, the DLT, I'll just uh, uh, speak to that. That's the distributed ledger technology, which is blockchain and, and, and post blockchain technologies. Um, it's, it's like the, the um, and transactions being there forever encrypted and on a, on a and shared ledger. Uh, so that's the tech enabling of all of this. Um, yes, so this, and this, this is the wonderful thing, is this actually emerged out of the practice of guerrilla translation, which is translation agency, that was, um, and they have, uh, I say they because I'm, I'm, I'm joining as part of the disco team, but I've known of guerrilla, and, and so I'll say they have had a, a wonderful agency that practiced a lot of these principles, and there's a blog there uh, that you can see, and they, there's, a, there's a wiki where a lot of these principles are, were actually um, uh, emerged as part of the, they, they saw we need something different and um, and suddenly it actually became something in and of itself. And that's where disco is a being um, now solidified and understood. And how this works, especially in terms of the different value systems. Guerrilla, so this is how Guerrilla Translation um, works. Um, so there is different types of work that you can do. There's work that people do pro bono. So say um, Bob wants uh, a text that's to be translated um, and, uh, sorry, so Bob is a guerrilla member, say, and says, oh, you know, there's a request to translate. This is really cool work. I want to do it, you know, we'll, we'll do it pro bono. Um, so th that, that, that is absolutely possible and say a hundred, um, actually, Stacco, could you jump in here? Because I, do, I, I want you to, um, you, you, I, I'm going to take longer. <laughs> my excuse. <coughs> oh my God, I just got something on my throat. I should give me the cue. <laughs> Allow me to drink some water. Everybody take yeah, a drink. Yeah, right? sure. Because in all honesty, I'm getting, I, I will say, just while he's working, I'm loving the experience of actually starting to work with these principles. They're start, starting to become real. So I, I, I just, I'm, I'm so on board. So Stacco, if you, you've got a better overview. Yeah, I mean, to pick up on what Sophia is saying, those of you familiar with the blockchain space, there's usually grand architects who are usually white males with a tech background. And they do ICOs, which are kind of like a reverse crowdfund. And they basically blueprint the next economy um, based on network topologies, meaning how technological nodes connect to each other. And, you know, there's like humans in there, but whatever. When we came up with the Disco governance model, it was actually based in our lived experience as a translation agency. <clears throat> who is trying to be an anti-capitalist translation agency. So it's like, what do we do? Let me see if I can get some ginger in my throat. Well, I'm eating nuts and ginger, bad combination. Mm. Okay. The way we do it in guerrilla translation is, say that for example, that we see this really cool text that's in Stair Magazine and we want to translate it to Spanish, yeah? So we choose, <coughs> sorry, I may be about to choke here. Um, Please hold. Okay, I think I can do it. So say that there's a text in, in Stern Magazine and we will translate it. And this is pro bono. We choose that we want to do it because we think it's good for the commons. Stern may not have a budget for this. So say that the text is 1000 words. So we say, hey, we'll do it for you for free and we'll do it for the commons, yay, for free. And we'll publish it in our magazine, etc. But that work is actually budgeted, <clears throat> sorry, the same way that we would budget translation work. 
So if it's a thousand words, we can say, okay, that would be the equivalent of a hundred pounds. And we put that in a ledger. <coughs> um, say that Stir comes to us and they say, well, actually, can you um, translate this thing, which is a workshop description, which is kind of like beyond here, and we're in partnership with Selgas Mill and we have a budget. And we say, okay, we're going to change the hat. And now you're going to talk not with the activist collective, but with a translation agency, even though we're the same. But depending on the means, we use different systems. So Stir and Selgos Mill, they can afford this translation. So we will give them a quote. And as luck would have it, it's the exact same number of words. It's, what a coincidence, it's 1,000 words. So we will give them a quote of 100 pounds. When Stir and Selgos pay us for the work that we've performed, 25 of those 100 pounds go back to the ledger that we've created by doing the pro bono work. And the reason that we do this, that we reward pro bono work is because not everybody can afford to be an activist. So if you're holding uh, down various jobs and you have a number of children, you're already working all the time between your work on the market and the care work that you're doing at home. Mm, can you go to a protest march at 11 or write a paper? You know, like some people can't do it. So this model with pro bono and agency work or what we call love work for the pro bono or livelihood for the agency, puts activism back, back to where it belongs, which is the workplace. If you're going to spend one third of your life in the workplace, you might as well do something useful for those other futures of work that we've mentioned. Um, just to finish this up and then I'll pass the mic. We're just using hip hop metaphors all the time. I'll pass the mic back to Sophia. Um, there's this conversion, which is the Disco governance model, which you can check at disco.coop slash governance model, I think, where Love credits and livelihood credits are basically shares. So just like um, you may have a, in, a, in a corporation, you may have the shareholders. In a disco, the co-op members are shareholders and they have three types of shares. One of them has to do with livelihood, um, the agency work. The other has to do with love work, the pro bono, but the third one is care work, which surrounds everything. And we'll talk, I'll talk more about care work, hopefully not shaking on some nuts um, when I go through the seven principles in a minute. So back to you, Sophia. Yeah, thank you. Um, so as you can see, there are these three different types of value streams that are accounted for. And it means that people can get to do work that's meaningful and it can get funded through work that people that that is being paid for in the normal way, in the market way, but also the so that also the behind the scenes admin and also the, the 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 work of checking that we're all all right so that basic work of checking in with each other and caring for each other which is culture which is the the, 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 the stuff that isn't even usually in, in lots of textbooks it's just the the very deep care work is valued and it's part on and it's made transparent so you can see these currencies see, you can the i like the notion of currencies and that means that the income is fairly distributed between all of these different types of work that's done. Um, yeah, so I, I find it at a personal level, having experienced it and being new to it, it's a very sort of, it's a healing of thinking, can we really work this way? And it actually works, you know, in terms of the flows. And, and when you, you know, it's, it's wonderful. So, okay, I'm going to pass you actually back to Sterko for any questions that you've got that, you know, spring up. And please, there are no such things as too simple a question, because as you know, there's always others who have them. As, Saku, are you good now with the thing? Otherwise, we can start um, yeah, taking I the think, questions. I think that I'm not choking anymore, so thank you for not watching my, my, my death live on a webinar. Um, sure, let's so have Roshin. questions for just a second. Um, ba -ba -ba. Let's have five minutes for questions. and. You can moderate Sophia, uh, but yeah, we can sure. all answer you, Felipe yeah. or, or I, I guess. Yeah. So uh, Roisin had her hand up. And uh, actually, if you want, if anybody wants, you can put your question into the chat and then we can have an overview of what we have time for, because some things we might end up answering later on. So if you could bear with us in that sense. So um, Roisin. So I'm really interested to know how you started. Did you have a model that you transitioned from or was this what you set up? Uh, so, <laughs> um, 
I don't know if it's from the art of war, but like the first rule of war is that, you know, when the war starts, like everything goes out the window. No, I mean, we came on the personal level, my partner, Anne-Marie, who's the co-author of the manifesto, um, she's from New York, I'm from Madrid. So Occupy was going on in New York and 15M, which was the Spanish counterpart that preceded it by three or four months was going on in Spain. Mm. And we just started translating things for the library at Sukoti that was hosted by Paris Smith and other people and the people in Madrid. Um, I've been a translator since 1997 and Anne-Marie is a copy editor. She's worked in press since the, <laughs> since the eighties. Um, so we decided let's do, how do we make this work sustainable? It's like, we want to do this. We want to like quit our bullshit jobs and just translate for the commons. So Guerrilla Translation came up, then we started working for the P2P Foundation and a lot of the stuff that was theorizing the P2P Foundation, we wanted to do it for real, not just like write research papers about it, but actually do it. And then in 2014, we came up with the governance model. Um, I mean, and GT has existed since then. It had like a couple of breaks, but um, it was super successful, way more than we imagined. I mean, we thought that we would have a problem getting people to like give us translation work and that it would be really easy to form a team. But no, getting translation work has never been a problem. Then we've always had more work than we had capacity. But making a non-hierarchical team, that's a challenge. And that's where the care work goes because, hey, I've just joined a co-op. But um, when they tell you, no, we have to talk about everything. Well, you know, like people look for the boss. Like when there's a power vacuum, people will insert hierarchy. And you see this in traditional co-ops, but you see this even more in discos. So I don't know. I don't know how to answer you. Um, we kind of like winged it. Um, part of it was theoretical, but, but, but out of this, like a rose disco. So disco is in this kind of like, if you like time travel, like series and films and paradoxes, disco is both the child of guerrilla translation, but now it's the mother because it's kind of like the model of which guerrilla translation is what we call a disco lab. Right now there's like six or seven other disco labs and maybe we can touch on that, but like guerrilla translation is the OG lab. But there's like plenty of articles that probably answer this question. I think that in the Disco Manifesto, there's a chapter about it. But from my personal, first personal some perspective, it's like, can't remember. We did a lot of stuff and yeah. out popped Disco, you know. Um, the next, sorry, there's a second half to the question that Mike Brown does into, into now. Um, are you running it on DLT? Are you using blockchain, actively using it to run Gorilla Translation? No, and it's a... Uh, so it's a pain in the ass because like we're doing it on spreadsheets and obviously the technology is not there. We're developing technology on Commons Pub. So those of you familiar with social.coop and Mastodon um, are familiar with the activity pub protocol. And this is the DLT that we're using for in disco transactions. Mm -hmm. Because you know, um, the blockchain talks about um, trustless technology. But if you're a group of 15 people working together in a co-op, how about you do the difficult work of trusting each other? So mm -hmm. you don't need blockchains. I mean, th there's a word which is famously absent in blockchain literature, which is sufficiency. And um, I think that we have to be judicious when we use blockchains. And there is um, a space for blockchains in the disco tech development, but we're not doing it yet. And that space is when you transact what an ugly word with someone that you don't know, whether it's a disco, a co-op, um, a social solidarity enterprise, etc. Then we can see whether we want to use blockchain or commons pub. But again, um, blockchain is a huge waste of energy. It works like shit. It is, if there's any blockchain developers here, <laughs> it is development hell. So, you know, like commons pub is much friendlier. Like what, what, what do you need? Like five USVs instead of like a little car or a bicycle. That, that is the comparison that I would give you when people talk about, oh, let's use this blockchain thing for this ecological future. And we're like, what? So again, with the Disco Manifesto, plenty of yeah. clues there. Thank, thank you, Stucco. Um, Simon's, you've ha Simon's had his hand up. Simon, would you like to go ahead? And then we've got a question um, in the chat from Nick. So if we go to Simon first and you're muted, you're muted, Simon. <laughs> um, so I want to know, uh, well, I, I wanted to, to, to explore with you how sort of like um, the value is agreed between the parties, I guess, in this and exchanged. Um, and is it equivalent between different subjective views of value? So, you know, you agree, I agree to do something with you, Stacco. You know, maybe we negotiate something. I'm not sure. Maybe it's a fixed price. Maybe it's a barter system. Um, but then, you know, sort of Mike agrees to do something with Christina. Is that is there an equivalence between our transaction and their transaction? You know, I'm kind of curious on these things. 
Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, but ironically, or funnily enough, this is the exercise that you're going to be doing. Okay. We're not going to we're not <laughs> gonna talk about the value model per se, because it's a lot of complicated economics, maths kind of things, but more about the relationships. But it's about what are the value ratios in your disco? You figure it out. You have to clarify your values. Once you're clear on your values, once you do that hard work between 15 or 20 people, then you figure out the percentages. But don't, don't you, I mean, yeah, you can use our templates, but this is based on our lived experience. So we invite you to, to do the same. I think that this is the time that we have for questions. We'll have more time afterwards. Am I correct, Sophia? That's right. We've gathered some questions in the chat, so most likely we'll be able to actually address those as you're in workshops, um, but we've gathered them and we've clocked that they're asked. Uh, so we're going to keep moving for now. And uh, um, yes, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you. We will I'll pass to Felipe. Hey, guys. Um, I'm taking easy, taking it easy with the video because I'm actually doing a lot of activity here in the background. So when I'm not speaking, I'll disappear. <laughs> um, guys, <clears throat> so I'm very satisfied with how the um, discussion has has developed. And I we are going now to talk about the seven principles. We're going to give the voice back to Stacco in a second. But I just want you to keep in mind that you're not absorbing this information as uh, information, but you're as tool, as tooling, right? As, as knobs and, and, and buttons and, and gears and as something that is meant to be worked with instead of something that is meant to be learned from a pure curiosity standpoint. So uh, just, just to provide this framing for a second and Travel, travel through this while Stacco talks about the seven principles, as if he was saying, this is a fork, this is a knife, this is a spoon. Okay, okay so with this culinary introduction, um, I'll tell you about the seven principles. So of course, seven principles, when we're talking about the cooperative sphere, obviously um, take us back to the OG seven cooperative principles which we love. So the seven disco principles do not come to do away with the original seven, but they sit on top or alongside or underneath. Um, the directionality doesn't, doesn't matter so much. And to us, they bring co-ops to the 21st century and to the realities of the digital economy and our ecological breakdown. The last time the International Cooperative Association revised the principles was in 1995. We have some issues with the language, so we may have to <laughs> raise some awareness about that, but OG cooperative principles, great, we love you. And we have the seven disco principles. It will be interesting to contrast this with the eight permaculture design principles by Ostrom, no, sorry, the eight commons um, principles for healthy commons by Ostrom, the 12 permaculture principles by Holgrim et al. Um, but these are our seven disco principles and I will and take you through them and I will give you some examples. Oh, so, you're going to sh screen this, share your screen, yes? Oh yeah, I forgot. Beautiful, yeah, no, beautiful. And so, it's nice because it gives us a breather to take stuff yeah, in because- this I was is a also lot of trying here, but I, I don't have the permission for some reason, I'm yeah. sorry. And so, so, so I'm emceeing and DJing at the same time. Oh my Yay. God. Yeah, yeah that's I not fair. It's, it's okay. I'm old. I'm older than I look. Um, so the first one is um, they're oriented in the statutes towards the common good. Now the common good can mean anything. So we're changing the name of this, but you can think about that they're oriented towards social and ecological priorities. Like Sophia alluded to, platform co-ops are great, but um, it's not enough to make a more democratic Airbnb and a better Uber that treats um, you know, the drivers not like trash. If we're not talking about housing, if we're not talking about um, transportation. So again, if you're going to spend one third of your life at the workplace, do something good, do something for, the, for this other future of work that we want to be thinking about. And don't just say it, put it on your statutes. And don't just say that you're a co-op and you follow the seven original principles, but actually not follow them. Like there are ways to have checks and balances and self-accountability. This is not state accountability. I mean, the state is just going to account for you for their own ends. Um, I believe that someone, probably a reader of Free From Alive has mentioned market state. So again, um, one definition of the commons is um, a community 
that gathers around a resource and uses the rules that they create as a community, not those of the state and the market. So those rules, they can be put in your constitution, in your statute, but also in your technological means, which is this more like DLT stuff. The second principle is that they're multi-stakeholder in nature. So this means that traditional co-ops are really good for the needs of their membership. Um, they take care of their members, but I was told that there's this kind of like co-op in Scotland that does cruise missile guidance systems. So sure, they are co-op, but maybe they want to get like a second opinion on what they do. So those of you familiar with the social care co-ops in Emilia-Romagna and Quebec, they're multi-stakeholder or multi-constituent. This means that instead of one person, one vote within the co-op, we actually make it more complicated. So for example, if we talk about like a medical disco, who would be the stakeholders? Um, well, obviously, um, if, it's, <laughs> if they don't do away with the likes of the NHS and social security in the rest of Europe, one stakeholder would be the state because they're putting the money for the, for the, for the medical thing. Yeah? Another stakeholder would be the doctors. They are the professionals with the knowledge, but um, also the patients can be another stakeholder and the family members of the patients. And this is not like an even split 25, 25, 25. You know, this can be like staggered and negotiated and, you know, um, have, a, have a conversation like, like Simon said. Um, what this does, it reflects what real economies do, which affect more than the people in the company or the workplace. Um, we've spoken about externalities before. This kind of like brings the externalities in a web of relationships. So, um, so our disco or our co-op does something. How does it affect the community? Shouldn't the community have a say in our actions? So this is what principle two is about. Three is that discos actively create commons. They don't just take from the commons, they create them. And this can be, you know, in guerrilla translation, we do all these translations that otherwise would not have manifested themselves in space time. They would have been kept in their original language. So we're creating commons. Big companies like Google with their multi-million investments in Linux, they're trying to like direct what could be considered a commons towards their own capitalist ends. So we think that we need other commons to be created, not this process of enclosure of the, of the commons. The fourth principle is that they're locally embedded yet globally oriented. So what this means is this is something that we took from our work in the P2P foundation and then expanded on. And the key phrase over here is what is light information knowledge is global. You can just share it in the computer. Here are some design files. Here are some translations that we do. But manufacturing should happen as near as possible to the place where what is going to be manufactured is going to be used. And to be honest, I should say production because like um, producing food is production, producing fiber, producing clothing. But for example, like take this shirt. It's not the best example, it's not very exciting, but imagine that it's like really flashy. So we create a design and we put that up and this is a commons. Everyone can download this shirt. It's the same principle behind WikiHouse and other projects. Where do you make this shirt? Do you write to Stacco and like Stacco is going to make your shirt? I say, no, like here's the design. You make it. Do you want to sell it? Great. That's what you can do. So that's principle four. Five is that they're centered on care work. Care work is a linchpin of feminist economics, and it basically means what is traditionally called reproductive work. So, you know, GDP, men, um, capital, you know, like shares, big money. Um, GDP is like this, the most bullshit statistic in the world because it takes a lot of invisible work to make that GDP and that's the externalities. And in traditional workplaces and even in co-ops, there's a lot of invisible labor and emotional labor being done usually by women who take up all this work. It's the same with the home and child rearing. Um, biologically, um, you know who gets pregnant and who gives um, birth to, to children, who cannot do certain things in the workplace, etc. So. All of these things we take into account and within this course, we distinguish two types of care work. One of them would be the obvious one, which is caring for the members of the collective. So, so in guerrilla translation, for example, everybody has like a mutual support person. And when somebody does not feel so good, somebody else supports them. We have a daily check-in, yeah? It's got four questions. And we adapted this from Lumio and then Spiral. You may know some of them. So the questions are, what did you do yesterday at work? I did this and that. How do you feel today? I feel great. I feel like crap. You say it. What is blocking you? 
you can say that too. And also, what are you doing for your well-being? Maybe there's a solution that you can share. So, I mean, and this happens every week. Recently, someone was not feeling so well and three people supported that person through like a really difficult day. And two of them are present here. We tagged him to make sure that this person was not left alone because this person needed. Um, we've had someone that had a problem with their residency in the country that they were working at. They didn't have to ask for help. They just said it in their daily check-in and we did the care work. The second aspect of care work is if the first is caring between the humans in the collective, in the disco, the second one is caring for the collective itself, because the collective, as you will discover in the exercise, is a set of shared values that we've agreed to as a commons that creates an entity. And the same way that we can talk about community land trust, it's like, you're all familiar with CLTs more or less. Um, so community land trust basically is like, here's this piece of land and somehow a group of us own it and you know we want to prevent an enclosure so we're going to make a law a trust that says that you cannot build a casino here or whatever is made here has to be for the benefit of um, disabled children for example with discos we have the disco cat as in cat meow and cat stands for community algorithmic trust and this has to do more with uh, with the technology side the second type of care work is actually what is traditionally called admin in companies but in activist projects, admin is very much invisible. So for example, you have like activists and you have the people who are in the marches and talking on the telly, et cetera, they're great. Who are the people doing the care work? Who are the people doing the spreadsheets, the social media? All of that works invisibilized. So we noticed that that was a problem in activism, but also delegating this admin work to um, a coordinator class. If anyone's familiar with Paracon, there's the capitalist, there's the workers, but in between there's the coordinator class. And this is the difference between the board, the shareholders and the CEO. The CEO is not one of the shareholders, but you better believe that he or she is not on your side. So we wanted to strike out all that. So there's care work, for the humans and this care work for, for the disco cut or for the spirit of the collective. The six we've touched upon, which is new origins and flows of values. Um, discos have three value streams. And as you will see, you figure it out. You figure out how you address these value streams. Um, one of them is livelihood work. So these are the goods and services that you provide as a co-op. If you're a gardening co-op, yes, okay, we're gonna do up your garden. If you're a, um, taxi co-op it's like okay the livelihood is me taking someone to somewhere else in my in my minicab um there's love work which is the pro bono work so the taxi co-op says hey we're going to drive um people you know who who need to go to the hospital but they cannot afford an ambulance say in the us because you know that's outrageous that's going to be our pro bono work Okay, so that's the love work that you do. Gardening, we're going to do gardening for the community center and we're gonna teach them to grow their own food um, one Friday every three weeks. That's your love work. So you got like your day job and you got like your activist pro bono. And then there's the care work, which I've just gone into. Um, in Disco, the Disco project, because the Disco project is a Disco, 75% um, is livelihood, 25 is love work. Care work is dynamic. It's based on percentages. So if someone does double the care work than the average, the other people take from their monthly allocation and gives it to them. This is all explained in the Disco governance model, not going to go into it much further. And the last one is that they planned for federation. Of the OG seven cooperative principles, the six is you know collaboration among co-ops, but this doesn't happen. And in 2018, co-ops worldwide had an annual turnover that was similar to that of Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Apple, over three trillion US dollars. Now, thanks to COVID, um, MAGAF, I call them MAGAF because it's like make America great with an F word at the end. Now they've gone up to like four, 4.5 trillion, again, COVID and the last three years. But just to say that we had a snapshot as recently as two years um, means that we can actually, we like co-ops don't have to be an economic alternative. They can be an economic counterpower, but they need to federate. So this is what Prime for Federation is. Um, get stuck in, we will go to in a minute, but I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Just let me say something on the principles and before we go to the exercise, these are the seven principles. The only requirement for anyone to create a disco is like, take these seven things as challenges, as patterns. How do you answer them from your reality, from your lived experience and that of your community? 
And this is why we keep going back to like, you figure it out. We'll give you tools. We'll give you software. We'll give you as much as you want. Do you want to do your disco accounting with spreadsheets and tally sticks? You can do it. We're not, we're not going to give you like a t-shirt or a, I don't know, maybe we'll make t-shirts, we'll see. Um, so that's the seven disco principles for all of you to enjoy. And I think that we're coming up to the disco builder exercise. We also have a break, so maybe we can take like a snap poll. Does anyone want the five minute break now um, to stretch, go to the bathroom, whatever, or in about 15 minutes? So I can't see you all, but I'm going to say like, put your hand up if you want the break now and don't put your hand up if you're okay with waiting another 15 minutes or so. Someone wants a break, stack off. One person wants a break. For me, that's good enough. So if it's okay with everyone, we can check in in five minutes and Felipe will take you over the exercise that we're going to do in the breakout rooms. Okay. Okay, so, and, so it's uh, 27 just... now. Let's try to be back here at 32, but Ted's had something to say. I was just going to remind people to switch off their um, cameras uh, if they want to have a break. Cool. So back here at 33, sort of. Okay. Great. See you soon. <laughs> If you feel so inspired. I, I don't have one. I'll have to compose it at some point. <laughs> yeah. I think um, distributed composition with the lag is, uh, is uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we can take a moment to feel the pain of all the hearts of the fallen lovers of the world who have been abandoned by someone. Yeah, that's, that's why I don't believe in five minute breaks. They, they just don't happen. <laughs> I think oh, also there was a couple of people who had to had to leave um, too. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we are, we're on it. We, we said goodbye to them. And it's a shame Warren is not going to be able to create his capitalist co-op. It would be great. <laughs> okay so i'm gonna start explaining i um let's see where's stacco is coming back um thomas stephanie and katie uh hope they're listening signal us when you get back here okay katie's alive Perfect. Um, guys, so what we're going to do now, with no further ado, is to go into a disco building um, prototype experiment. And where we're going to try to use the principles firsthand and, and make decisions collective, collectively around the principles firsthand, right? <clears throat> so we are about um, minus three, right? So one, two, three, four, eight, 12, 15, minus three, 12. So I think we can do well with three groups of four 
randomly assigned, right? Um, so whoever is the host and is doing the tech part, jump on creating three That's me. breakout rooms. That's me. Yeah, I'm ready to go on that when you when you let me know. Okay, so just have it set up for like randomly assigned. And as we we one each one of us, Felipe, Sofia, and Stacco, we're gonna be inside one of the rooms. And the main goal, you guys are going to um, choose a random number between one and 17. And that will give you a type of business that you guys are gonna create around. So what I would like you guys to do is to sort of pretend that you always wanted to, to create that, that specific business, okay? Let's just fall in love, like fall in love with it for the sake of, of excitement. And there's a set of questions. So whoever has a, a little pad open, I want you guys to, to take note of these questions and we're also gonna post them in the chat. So don't worry, right? And the danger of this prototyping thing is that you might, you might go about things on the business as usual way, right? And you might feel seduced to see the index of success or, or mean your goals and, and what success looks like from this old lens. So these questions are more like a, a rail to help you uh, deal with the hard questions that uh, this creative constraint of the disco uh, manifests. So the question number one is identifying the invisible labor and care work um, that needs to be done, right? So setting it within the the frame of the of the of the co-op is super important. The second question, is to de determine what pro bono work, what we call love work in the in the disco, is going to be. Like, right? who does it serve? Who are you working for free for? How are you? Who are you supporting um, with nothing asked in exchange, or at least in terms of financial exchange, right? And how does that is how does that create a comment? Then determine the paid work. Is it the same as the pro bono work, but just done for money instead of for free, or is it different? Is there a relation between them? Is there uh, what adaptations are needed when you're doing the pro bono work or the paid work, or what we call livelihood work, right? Um, and the last thing I would like you guys to do is to predefine in your group who is going to be the the presenter that's going to tell this story. And I want you to tell this story with a specific frame. And this being the most important part of the explanation. And don't worry, we're going to be in the groups helping you out. You're going to tell a story of five years in the future of a successful disco, right? What happened? What were the problems that uh, were overcome um, by you guys as a group? Cool. So it's sort of a speculative fiction exercise. Um, so let me just post these questions here in the chat. And let's do a little question round before we fire off everybody into the 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 rooms does anybody have any questions if the, the i was just wondering was if you might be able to clarify is this um a fictional disco that people are coming up with together yes or one that they are currently working in a fictional one right just to to try to balance out power in the group so you guys are going to, we have a list, a secret list hidden between seven servers and seven uh, security agencies. And you're going to say, just say a random number. And we're gonna go to that list and tell you what your, your disk will be. Any other questions? No? All right, so shoot us out into the, the breakout rooms making sure if possible that there's one facilitator per room. Just one thing, Felipe, before we do that. Yes. Shouldn't we give people like a tour of Miro now instead of in the breakout rooms? Maybe, yes, sure. Sophia, do you want to post the, the Miro link here in the, in the chat? Do you have it? <clears throat> I think I have it open here. I can go. All right. Yes, yes, I've boom, got it. Boom, boom, boom. There we uh, go. Just right. to let you know, um, Nick's just asking how long is it going to be? It's going to be 60 minutes. 60 minutes. And then a presentation. 
It's there. Um, Felipe, you can dive right in. Uh, and to be right. clear, and also... um, sorry, during the breakouts, if you need to go to the bathroom or take a break, you can do so. And we will have explicit break before the presentation, etc. They're one hour long. Yes. The breakout is one hour long. You have one hour. Yeah. And then and feel free to that, participate. Lara, sorry. I believe that Lara is recording this. So if anyone needs to go off, you can always contact Lara and she can give you the, the, the recording of the, of the full workshop. Yeah, and, and, and there's no um, there's no issue with you living midway. Just participate as long as you're having fun, as long as it's relevant to you, or as long as you have time and it's available. And when you need to leave, leave. And if you feel like coming back, come back. Um, let's keep it plug and play, All right? So if you follow the link that's in the chat right now, that's a, a little service called MyRoport that has become incredibly useful during Corona times. As a facilitator, I'm, I'm usually working with big murals and boards with a lot of uh, post-its and harvesting things by hand, writing out what people are saying, creating little connections like those uh, detective boards that you see on movies and doing things. And we are not afforded this anymore during Corona times. And then so somebody created this beautiful software that does basically the same thing. So um, take a look, see that you can create post-its, you can copy things, you can take notes, write things down. So basically, we're all going to be working on this own Myro board, but we're all going to have our own video chat. So we have this big collective creation, which we can connect later and trade uh, learnings from later. And they're going to be available forever for the whole world. So as we keep doing this workshop, we're going to have more and more disco prototypes that people can actually just pick up and, and play with. Uh, templates, if you will. Felipe, can I interrupt? Um, Question. To... Felipe? Yes. Just for clarification, yes. there yes. will be one Miro board for each breakout group, yes? Or one Miro board for everybody here? I, I don't see the reason of having uh, three different Miro boards. I, I think having one is completely fine. We each go to our corners um, right. because we're going to be talking over different rooms and that's okay. Yeah. Um, Nick could uh, also like to ask a clarifying uh, Nick, question. So no, my, my question is just, I, I don't currently have any questions, but I anticipate not really knowing what to do and want, maybe wanting to ask during the breakout. Okay, so the way breakout rooms work is that this room will kind of still exist and you will have the, 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 the chat thing still be shared. So if you write something in the chat, everyone in every room will see it. Okay. Uh, at least in my experience, that's how it works unless Zoom changed something. Mm -hmm. um, also, you can... Um, just write it on the Miro itself, um, you know? Okay. Maybe I can have a little question corner that I can pay attention to and you can just put your post-it book question there. Okay. We'll, fi we'll figure it out. Also, there's gonna be a facilitator uh, in, in the breakout room in the... each and we are aligned and such and such. So okay, that, that's, be fine. that makes sense. Also, of course, we have a meta channel where we're... Any other questions? No, are we all good? All right. Okay, cool. so let's I'll see fire you guys the... in 60 minutes. Hi Simon, have you seen uh, are you not wanting to join the group or have you not seen the thing pop up?
Hi, Thomas, I can see that you haven't um, yet um, gone into a room. I was just wondering if you were there or not and returned back from the, to, from the break. Or if you just yeah. um, touch your cursor to the dock, you'll find this, the, um, the Zoom app. That's another mm. way of doing it. And, mm -hmm. and it, if, if you use the keyboard for long enough with the tab key, the tab key stops working, which is what ha what's happened with my Mac. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so is it right for getting a Mac? <laughs> mm. No, that's not true. If you have everything as full screen, you can just do this in your trackpad. You can just scroll through yeah. them in two seconds. And it's so much better than everything else. <laughs> People keep shitting on Macs just because they want to be edgy. That's right. It's, on, a, can... it, it's a four finger swipe on trackpad. Yeah. <laughs> I just did this and I'm anywhere I need. Okay. It's great so... when you can find the, the room again. <laughs> Lara, lovely, lovely I think you room. have you have a better idea. Are we all here? Are we missing anyone? Yeah, we're all I'm back missing. in the room. Everybody's I'm back not in, in the room. room. I'm oh. not in the room. David, no? I'm not in the room. Yes, D D David, that's right. We had trouble with David, you've got did you say you're on an iPad? You're on an yeah. iPad. Felipe, could you, what does David need to do to find the Zoom app on an iPad? To find the, the Zoom app. Uh, yeah. It's still going to be running. If you scrape your fingers from the bottom, uh, four fingers from all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top, you're going to see all the apps that are running. Just click the Zoom and you will be with us. Nick is trying to come back. I have to admit him. Okay, so here's an iPad. What you're going to do is going to do this. I don't think he can see you, Felipe. Running. I don't think oh, yeah, he probably David can't. can see you. Yeah, so basically just scrape your fingers all the way from the bottom, all the way to the top. And then I all the that. others are going to show up. I did it that. might not work the first time because it's a bit finicky, but it's just yeah. like do this all the way to the top. What a big iPad you have, Felipe. <laughs> yeah. David, I, I would iPad. say, I would say d if you can't, I wouldn't. Didn't, don't just worry go about back to my email much. and come into the Zoom, yeah? Yeah, just listen to us or do that. that yeah. We can hear you, which is... Yeah, we can hear you very clearly. And, okay. and um, I, would, I would not worry too much. Okay. Yeah. Um, I also like to say hello to Stephanie, um, who's building a skate punk disco. Uh, so hello, Stephanie. <laughs> Hi, it's Daco. I actually <laughs> have a, a confession. On Thursday and Friday, I'm taking part in a two-day kind of... Um, workshop um putting forward an idea the idea is a film production cooperative and i just really wanted to say sorry to philippe and and everyone in mike and, and people in Royston in my group that i'm not stealing the ideas it's just been really useful sitting in this today so well, the everything. ideas are designed to be stolen yeah so. yeah exactly. yeah, theft. <laughs> so. <laughs> but she got lucky because she actually like we did the randomization thing exactly to keep it imaginative and fun and sort of inner childlike instead of somebody working towards their real project. And I'm really happy you didn't tell us during the, the, the collaboration. You're just like, you got, you got lucky and you got what you mean. I got very lucky, totally. I think that sounds like a film, is it Total Recall? But anyway, thank you. <laughs> so let's move into the presentations. Uh, Nick is trying what? to get in. Nick, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I have admitted in. Nick back in, but it just keeps saying joining. So I don't know if he's having problems. Do you have his contact somewhere else? Because we should yeah, maybe let's... try to. I'll do, do that. We wanna if you take, guys carry do we want to take a five minute break to make sure that Nick is in, maybe stretch, relax, and then go on for another 20 minutes or so? Is that too The long? thing is, my, my storyteller needs to go really soon, Roshane. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, I would say that let's Fine. carry on if that's okay with everyone, just because uh, this is already slightly longer session. And yeah, just and there's check, also a we'll recording. Then, yes. So David, you will have access to the faces when you see the recording. So if you could okay. imagine them right now, we know you're there, all right? Okay. Great. Great. So Roshin, so, do you wanna do you wanna carry us over then, um, or do we have any steps before the storytelling begins? Let's do it. She's already being super patient with everybody. I don't want to stretch her, her goodwill too much. Who, me? Yes, yours. That's just because you made that huge gap. Yes, yes. I still thinking about it. I'm going to send you a cake. Portugal straight away. It was around Porter Um Someone say no. cake? No, not cake. <laughs> no Only cake. If you have I, just said, I just said that Ireland was part of the UK. She's already angry. 
say that again it's really offensive um okay moving along quite quickly um you might want to i don't know like do you want us to do this from the mirror board or do you want us to do this in zoom i feel like you need to be in both places um, whatever's more um, comfortable for you just do it yes exactly okay um all right and uh haven't we haven't really gotten to prepare a story so i feel like just bear with me two seconds okay Great stuff. So um, I'm really delighted that everybody has been able to join our business as we look back and celebrate the last five years um, of the Frameflow disco. So originally we came together as a group of mates looking to work on a really exciting project. And we had all attended this curious workshop and met a couple of people and then realized we were all really interested in film. Mike had some ideas on how to build a screenplay. Stephanie had some ideas on, on how we could run a disco. And I was wanting to change the world as always. And we really looked at how we, what we wanted to do as a group and as a collective. So um, one of the biggest things that we decided was that we wanted to resist quality ratings as a core principle of how to make film. We also wanted to create a federation of, of other discos, you know, for things like costume and catering and skeleton set location and set design. So as we were building our disco, we were encouraging and educating other people and inspiring other people to build their disco as well. And in, in 2021, we had this amazing piece of work that we delivered. We had a film called A Slice of Disco that was reviewed by Ben Rivers and Steve McQueen. Um, and it was um, showcased on regular distribution through Means TV with, and we ended up with this huge growing membership of supporters and people who came to work with us and to, to cheerlead us and to provide us with momentum and, uh, you know, they hired us so that and paid us properly so we could use that money in both the different sections of our disco and build the kind of business and company we wanted to build. And ultimately with the principles of working on the things that we loved, working and recognizing care work and being paid for livelihood work as well. And we crafted that and wove that back in. And we, you know, really loved that we got to work on uh, training less people who didn't have access to the kind of opportunities or education that we'd had access to. Um, we liaised with film schools at the beginning and we still have some ongoing relationships there. We're teaching film and productive populations and in locations that wouldn't normally have access to it. And we're producing films and highlighting social issues around a new economy. We also do a bit of rental of equipment and really we're still, you know, journeying through developing film for, for provocations and for getting people to think. And that's what we're making our, our livelihood around, which is amazing. Um, so the care work, we really recognized that we needed to um, pay attention to people who liaise within local communities and continuists and mentor and train and, uh, you know, really looked at how our cooperative roles could be exchanged and celebrated all of the different ways in which we moved through all the three different systems of how we worked. So um, we've got a new film coming out and we're hoping to launch that shortly and we look forward to seeing you then. Hang on, because we're muted. Let's just get like a big round of applause. Okay. Okay, so 
I'm going to have like a super quick feedback round at the end, but keep in mind what, what Rosen has just presented. I'm particularly very excited about it and I would love to see it come to life. But now we will be moving on to Dashen Simon, middle name Myro Redding, who was just flying, just putting post-its with feet and hands and everything. So we volun told him to do the presentation. So Simon is going to present. Do you want to say the name of the disco, Simon, as we lead off? Yeah, yeah, I'm just getting it right back so I can see what, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, we are a collective um, who are starting Micro Riser Disco, um, which is Grow Mushrooms with Added Disco, um, locally to an international formula. And uh, our objective is to grow mushrooms while growing ourselves. Um, and uh, to form something that is, uh, you know, regenerative in its nature, but provides food for our community, but also strives to look after um, the things that we value dear. So I'm going to sort of walk through the uh, seven principles and um, go through some uh, explanation of how we aim to do this. Um, firstly, in um, of looking at our values as a collective organization um we are wanting to have minimum input uh, impact on our environment um and make it really positive where we can so using minimum energy input striving for zero waste and um, making our own packaging from our own waste products um our stakeholders um, are considered to be not just our staff and our customers and also the people who take our waste, but the planet and children in local schools. And a key um, principle of our organization is that we look after our growers. So we have a whole community governance. Um, I just need to zoom this in so I can actually see the words. <laughs> There's some very small writing on this mirror board. Um, so workers and customers together decide on what crops will be grown. Thus, we're not growing things that aren't needed. We all get chances to try, the, to try every job. And this is mandatory. So we all un understand every perspective from growers, drivers, packers, sales assistants, marketing teams. If you don't understand the other person's job, then you're just going to sort of like, uh, you know, at some stage, um, be cross with them and other them. Um, exchange rates of value are defined through community deliberation. So we get together um, to define um, how we work and what the, uh, the value that we all get paid is. Um, and there are collaboratively agreement, collaborative agreements that are multi-stakeholder um, around commitments to uh, use of chemicals and um, to uh, looking at our different um, interest groups, like the waste suppliers, like the infrastructure providers, like will we buy our electricity, these kind of things. Uh, in this, we are active creators of commons. We are giving back into a common repository of knowledge and capability. Um, so we, in looking at doing things um, locally, we are creating international um, capabilities, a library of mushroom growing techniques, processes for use of feedstock and waste that can be shared into wider systems, an open source mushroom manual. Um, chemicals will be eliminated from our food um, as a result of our processes, and we will create knowledge on how to care for soil using our waste products for the wider agricultural systems. Um, in looking at the way that we interact between our local um, farms and the global uh, initiatives, um, we have a concept called mushroomsnearme.com, where you can where we design our systems globally but grow locally. But we can also adapt our systems for local growing conditions based on the input of the people who know best local people. Care work is core to what we do. We grow our people first and we don't treat our staff like mushrooms. Um, we compassionately host meetings. We hold, hold the space and let people have a say. Um, and there is clear conflict resolution built into the framework of our organizations. 
Um, we are iterative, though. We don't. We're, we're not going to create this and set it in aspic. Um, we are going to learn from our successes, our failures, and the feedback of those around us to iteratively create different versions of our operating model and slowly improve what we do over time. And we're going to actively harvest knowledge from our workers and our elders. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to actually plant our elders and use them as mushroom farm compost, by the way. Um, so uh, selling used material as a garden fertilizer is a key um, sort of uh, value uh, deriver for us. Um, and we're going to make, as such, we're going to make value from uh, refuse. Um, but we also recognize that other sources of value are, you know, growing and picking time, um, sales value, sales time, and um, we will need to buy our inputs of, uh, you know, sort of straw and things um, from animal bedding. Um, and finally, this is primed for federation. As I said, it's it's a global thing, um, but with local instances. We will share mycological expertise in our business models. And we also work with in wider systems because we recognize that waste has value in a federated system. Okay, let's have a big round of applause from Simon Redding from 2025 and from microoilsolutions.coop. <laughs> Okay, friends, to close us out, it's late. I'm going to ask you a few questions and just do a little bit of housekeeping. Then I will give it over to Lara for beyond here, more general housekeeping. Um, so those of you that don't have the camera on, these questions are basically put your hand up so you can put your hand up in the chat. The first question is, who found this process fun? Okay. The second question is, who found it challenging? Good. We're meant to challenge ourselves, but because care work is part of DISCO, we support each other through the challenges. Third, who found it maddening? Come, put your hand I up. I didn't catch the question. There's maddening. 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 Okay. So Mike, yeah. and, Mike and Nick, okay. Um, Fourth question, who found it inspiring? Okay, so, so Nick found it both maddening and inspiring, so that's good. Mike, we, we'll need to have a chat later. Um, okay, here's my last question, and then I will make an offer to you. Who would want to see Flow Frame Productions and MicroRisalSolutions.com, our two discos, actually come to real life? It doesn't mean that you have to do it, okay? <laughs> so we're going to inaugurate a section in disco.coop called Disco Speculative Fictions, where your breakout groups, if you want to get together and write a little article, so this will be like a sci-fi article of those discos. And if you prefer to write them in the present, going towards the future, we talked about time travel in our group. Yeah, it, it wasn't about magic mushrooms, but there was like a lot of kind of like magic mushroom kind of talk with this kind of like future past thing. If you want to write an article about the speculative fiction, we will publish it because this can be inspiring for people. And eventually we'll do like a notice board. One of the pieces of software that we're doing is called the Disco Blocks. And this will enable you to create through drag and drop components, governance models for your disco and to program the software. But you can do it for real because you really want to create a disco and you have people who are committed or you can do it for fun. And if you do it for fun, this will eventually go into a notice board because other people might want to do it for real. And you've already thought, so the more resources we have, like maybe other people want to make film production discos. We don't know. Maybe other people want to do discos around mycorrhizal solutions. This kind of like sci-fi concept can actually be really useful for people. And maybe other people can do the heavy lifting and you can chime in and join. So that's our offer to you. Um, housekeeping things from the disco side. Disco.coop. Um, you can start with the Disco Manifesto if you want. That's a bit of a longer read. Um, coming towards the end of December, we will publish the second part of the manifesto, the Disco Elements, which is less about the why, but how about the how, how to get stuck in. Uh, we said today, like, how do you create a disco? What are, what are the things? That's more practical. 
Um, our newsletter is going out tomorrow on Wednesday, and there's a lot of stuff that's not on the website that we've been doing kind of like underground, like mycorrhizal networks that will shall bloom um, in the next few weeks. So if you sign up for the newsletter, there will be an update this week about disco stuff. And, you know, if you want to do the speculative fiction thing, um, write to us. If you want to make a disco lab, write to us. So for example, we're in contact with Stephanie and Mike, and again, we're totally overwhelmed right now. That's the reality of things. But as we produce more resources, more people can do on their own things on their own, maybe without our intervention. So that's it from us. So on behalf of Felipe, Sofia, and I, and the Disco Notes, give yourselves a round of applause. Um, you've been great. You've been challenging, fun, maddening, and inspiring. Um, all the things, and I think that's a great combination. You know, like come on, let's let, let's have it all on the table. And special thanks for Lara, who's been super patient and she's been like DJing and giving things. I told her last Friday, oh, we're going to do this. And today, like, it's going to be three instead of two. And she's been a total champ. So thank you for all the care work, Lara. Um, admits a very difficult situation worldwide right now where things are not normal and we have to acknowledge that. I really want to, like, all of us, like, give Lara a big round of applause yeah. for this workshop and all the other ones. Um, thank you so much. And with that, um, Unless Sofia and Felipe, my colleagues, want to say anything, shall we pass it over to Lara? Okay, so Wonderful. Lara, it's all thumbs up. Oh, thank you so much. And that was a really nice, um, thank you also, Stacco, at the end. That was very, very kind of you. Um, I'm really gutted I missed out on the uh, sessions. They sound so fun. And actually, what a privilege to be able to be out of the room and then hear these wonderful ideas that took less than 60 minutes to come up with. Um, I'm enamoured with both of them. And interestingly enough, the same as um, Roisin said, I'm, I, we're actually talking about exactly the same thing with mushrooms right now here at Selgas Mill. And uh, we're, we're starting with some mushroom spores this week, uh, just for fun. So uh, really interesting. And my, my brother has also um, uh, got his own film company. And uh, so I love the idea of the, the film company, a company disco too. Um, and I'm gonna tell him about it. So if, um, e if any of you do end up writing the sci-fi, uh, fiction please do share and I can always share that with the rest of the group um uh this is the last um beyond here this year but we more than likely are going to do some more sessions next year so please do keep an eye on that and we'll um update you about things uh coming up uh what a lovely group it's been and um I always love these afternoons thank you so much to Felipe and Sophia and Stacco for today and thank you all those that stayed um i will be in touch with an email and with the recording um tomorrow lots of love bye thank you